Welcome to Musical Memories of Ellie Wiesel, sponsored by Moment Magazine and Zamir Choral Foundation. We will begin in one moment with a song performed by Ellie back in 2010. Shepshiv Leinu Zohar Lo Nuwoi Vayifrekeinu Mitzoreinu Oi Shepshiv Leinu Zohar Lo Nuwoi Vayifrekeinu mitzoreinu oi Shep shivleinu zohalonu oi Vayifrekeinu mitzoreinu Shep shivleinu zochalanu shep shivleinu zochalanu kile yoylam kile yoylam Oh, <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Suzanne Borden, Moment Magazine's Zoom and R producer, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Musical Memories of Ellie Wiesel. Today's wonderful program is being recorded, and the link will be available on our website later this week. The song that you just heard is called Sheb Shaf Shaflano and was sung by Ellie in 2010 during a special concert, Memories and Melodies for my child of My Childhood, at the 92nd Street Y. Ellie was conducted by Matthew Lazar, founder and director of the Zamir Choral Foundation, and you'll hear from him a little bit later. Also joining us today is Rabbi Ariel Berger, Cantor Deborah Kachko Gray, and Cantor Joseph Malavani along with Moments Editor-in-Chief Nadine Epstein. Nadine is also the editor of the book, Ellie Wiesel, An Extraordinary Life and Legacy. I'll now hand the program over to Nadine Epstein. Please enjoy. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I love to sing, but I never sang with Ellie. We talked about many things, but music somehow never came up. 
it wasn't until after he died when I was working on this book about his life and his legacy that I learned how important music was to him. And I even learned that he sang and he had a beautiful voice as you just heard. Ever since then, I have had this dream of putting together an event where we remembered him through music. Music is another way, a way that speaks to everyone that could help us remember him. And it's a very little known part of his legacy. And we're gonna explore it today. And that's why this year we're remembering Ellie on what would be the eve of his 92nd birthday. And we've invited some very special guests, people who knew him well, and all of whom sang with him um, to join us today to talk about his musical legacy. We're going to start with Ario Berger. Ario met Ali as a teenager, and he was a lifelong student of his. He's an Orthodox trained rabbi, and he received his PhD in Jewish studies and conflict resolution under Ali, and he served as his teaching fellow for five years. So he really knew Ellie well. He's the author of the National Jewish Book Award winner, Witness, Lessons from Ellie Wiesel's Classroom, and he's the founding director and senior scholar of the Witness Institute, whose mission is to empower emerging leaders inspired by the life and legacy of Ellie Wiesel. So, Ariel, could you tell us a little bit about what music meant to Ellie, why, why music was so important to him? Of course, Nadine, and thank you for having me. This is a, a wonderful lineup. Your viewers are in for a lot of treats. Uh, the simplest thing to say is that Professor Wiesel loved music. It was in his bones, in his kishkas from the time he was a child. And sometimes in, in the classroom where he taught at Boston University and elsewhere, he would talk about his love of music and how his parents wanted him to be the next Yasha Haifetz and he learned violin and after the war he was a choral conductor. We'll hear more about some of these elements from others I think on this panel. Um, music played a specific role in his life also and I want to just highlight two different ways that music made a very big difference for Professor Wiesel. Uh, and these are both examples of things that I think are very relevant today for all of us. There were two primary questions I think in his life where music played an important role. The first question that he faced after the war, after the Holocaust, after the last page of Night, for those of you who have read Night, was how do I go on? And how can I turn suffering into joy and hope? Because anyone who knew Professor Wiesel knew that he was a person of great joy and humor and celebration. But if you remember the end of Night is a very dark moment. A corpse is looking back at the newly liberated Eliezer from the mirror. And so how did he move from that darkness to becoming a person who could choose life in so many ways? Choose to have a family, choose to invest in the next generation of students and not give up on the world, not give up on God, even though he had many quarrels with God. How did he do that? And there are several pieces to the response, but I think music played an essential role here. And I believe from our conversations that his greatest secret weapon really was music, especially the warmth and the depth and the insistence on joy that we find in Jewish music broadly and Hasidic music specifically. And as he often said, Hasidism, the, the great revolutionary renewal movement that started 200 years ago in Eastern Europe, which deeply influenced Professor Wiesel's childhood, because his grandfather was a Hasid, was a Vishnitzer Hasid, and we'll hear more about that later as well, I think. Hasidism teaches us how to build on ruins, how to rebuild. And the music of Hasidism is an essential expression of that, that power of finding joy and hope and life in spite of everything. And so he told me once that he always, always has a Hasidic nigun, a melody in his head, no matter where he goes. And it was those melodies, I think, as well as the tales and teachings of the Hasidic movement and of Judaism more broadly, and of course, all the other great world literatures and, and uh, novels and plays and so on that he loved and that he taught, but with Judaism at the center and Hasidism at the center of the center, it was those melodies that he carried through places of suffering and later on the halls of power. And, you know, this is reflective of the Jewish condition. We turn everything into song. If you think about 
many of you may know the song we sing, one of the songs we sing at the Passover Seder, Vihi She'amda. And it's a song about how every generation we're persecuted, God saves us in the collective, but there are casualties along the way. This is a, a difficult story. Jewish history is not a simple story, but we turn it into a song. It's, it's a light song. And we turn joy into song, but we also turn tragedy and pain into song. And I just want to highlight one teaching from Professor Rizal from the classroom that I just really just came back to me a moment ago, right before we started. Um, the visionary artist, William Blake, has a, a series of illustrations of the book of Job. And Professor Rizal pointed out that the biggest contribution that Blake made to our understanding of the story of Job and Job's suffering and his rebellion against the injustice of God is in the contrast between the first image and the last image of his series of illustrations. In the very first image of Blake's illustrations of the book of Job, Job and his family are standing beneath a tree, and a giant tree, and in the tree are hanging musical instruments. And no one in the family, Job and his family, no one is playing an instrument, no one is holding an instrument, they're all in the tree. In the last illustration, after Job has gone through everything he's gone through, his protest, his rebellion, God appearing to Job but not answering any questions, now Blake has Job and his family perhaps his new family, perhaps not, holding the instruments and playing them. And so Professor Rizal pointed out that for Blake, Job, the book of Job is a movement from no music to music. And that's the lesson of the book of Job, that we can sing in spite of everything. In Hasidic tradition, it's important to say that there are two primary kinds of song, of wordless melody, and both of them make appearances in Professor Rizal's music. There are songs of hisorerus, songs of uh, awakening, of, of uh, celebration or encouragement. Sometimes the martial music you hear in some melodies. There's a Chabad Nigun melody that goes, that's a, very, it's a marching song. It's a going to war kind of song. We're going to battle, uh, we're our internal battles, and we need a marching song for that. There are other kinds of songs that are songs of yearning, of kisufin, of yearning. And these are very different modes. Um, the famous melody of the Baal Shem Tov fits into this category. It begins, And it continues with, inexpressible, barely expressible yearning. And sometimes we find a melody that has one or the other, but sometimes you find melodies that combine the two, either in different parts of the song or even in one melody. And this speaks to an immense emotional range and Professor Rizal had this emotional range. And so you'll hear in the music that we heard and that we'll hear a little bit later on, you can pay attention to when you hear the more celebratory, um, encouraging kinds of modes and the more yearning um, awareness of pain and transmuting that pain into something else modes that appear in the music. Uh, on uh, The second question that Professor Wiesel, I think, wrestled with in his life was how to speak the unspeakable, how to express the experience of the Holocaust. And we all know he, he felt this was a sacred obligation. He encouraged survivors to tell their stories all the time. But he also felt it was impossible to really convey the experience. And this was a paradox that drove him to 10 years of silence after the war. He didn't write about the Holocaust or speak about the Holocaust for 10 years. And then he began to write. His process of writing Night was profound. It was a process of writing a longer book and then cutting it down, as you know. And I know you've spoken to him about this, Nadine. And it's a, such an important, powerful modeling of the attempt, the powerful, successful attempt to speak the unspeakable. And his words have transformed millions of people around the world. But he often worried that he had not found the right words because if he and other survivors had found the right words, there would have been no Cambodia or Yugoslavia, or Rwanda or Darfur. And so he felt that there was something more to say or to, to express that couldn't be expressed through words. 
And so I think his response to the question of how to speak the unspeakable ultimately is that you can't fully speak the unspeakable. You have to sing it. And so there were many moments in the classroom when he arrived at the end of language and he stopped speaking and he started to sing. And so in addition to being a source of great joy and comfort, I think for him uh, and something he just loved to do so much as we'll hear more, um, he also found profound meaning and ways of solving existential problems that seemed very formidable. And there's much more to say here, but let's move beyond words to some more music. I'm going to briefly introduce a clip of Sheba Shiflenu. Um, you heard it in a performance of Professor Wiesel singing it so beautifully in a concert of songs, melodies of his childhood. We're going to see a short, short clip of Professor Wiesel's visit to a Jewish day school in Washington, DC. And the last thing to say here is that he came to a, a room full, a classroom full of young students, and he made the choice not to speak, but to sing. And his choice, and I think his choice in his life, and I think something he was deeply committed to and dedicated to was to transmit the joy and the yearning of Judaism and Jewish life and Jewish history and Jewish values and stories to the next generation. And he did that here through melody. I used to be a choir conductor. <laughs> and I will sing your song only for you. Mm -hmm. And you will. It's a song which I learned when I was too late, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Ariel. That was beautiful. I wanted to now introduce our next guest, Deborah. Kachko Gray. She was a student of Ellie's at Boston University. She's a fourth generation cantor and she founded the Women's Cantor Network in 1982. Since 1999, she's been the cantor at Congregation Sheer Shalom <coughs> in Connecticut. And her story is included in The Invisible Thread, a portrait of American Jewish women and her book, Prayerful Creations, is about the Jewish Swedish weaving, Jewish Swedish weaving of Teletot. <coughs> her recording and her songbook, Kachko, Three Generations of the Cantorial Art, is unique with guitar chords in a female friendly key. And her 10 recordings include Passover Seder songs, Kinder songs, and Hanukkah songs of light and hope. And she's going to speak to us and also perform for us today. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Going to begin with Professor Rizal's voice. So 
God is king, may he order that Israel be redeemed. So powerful to hear Professor Rizal sing those songs. I'm honored to be here today to share some wonderful musical memories that I have. It all began with his very first class, the only one that he taught on the Holocaust specifically. It was September 1976 at Boston University. He had to limit the number of people in the class because there was a fire code and so many of us wanted to take his class. So he asked us to write on a three by five card, why do you want to take my class? It was very tough for him to select who's going to be in his class. You can imagine the whole idea of a selection uh, was distasteful to say the least. So I remember I wrote something like this. I said, I'm from a family of cantors. Uh, well, in 1976, I didn't know a woman could be a cantor. So I said, I'm from a family of cantors. I love Jewish music and culture, and I want to teach Jewish children about our history, and I want to find out what happened to my family um, from, from Europe. I want to know more about it. And his answer to me changed my life. He said, my door will always be open to you. And Professor Rizal was a, a little bit of a rebel. Uh, I was also a bit of a rebel, I, maybe I still am, but he didn't mind breaking a few rules. So I could sit in on every single class. I registered for whatever I could, but then I sat in on everything. So I like to joke that I majored in Elie Wiesel at Boston University. And it's interesting that that class was the only class that he ever taught specifically on the Holocaust. Every class had some element of it, but it was the only class that was just about the Holocaust. And it was so painful, he never taught it again. And I met Joel Rappel a few years ago, his archivist of many years, who's now in Israel. And believe it or not, he said that my class notes are the only thing that remain of that class. And I realized um, today that it's a little bit beshared because there's nine recordings from a sing-along that I'm gonna talk about in a bit. And there are nine classes of notes that I want to share. So I think it's beshared. And it really wasn't until this that I put that together. But we've all read the devastating statistics on the ignorance about the Holocaust. And so I feel more passionately than ever that his notes should be shared. <clears throat> so I have a few uh, brief memories. Very powerful, though. In Danbury, Connecticut, in the 80s, if anyone remembers going to an Eloise lecture, it was a happening. It was packed to the gills. People were standing. It was full of all ages. There were always many Holocaust survivors. It was a very emotional, it felt like a, a big reunion. And his lectures were so powerful. People came to, to hear what I call a, a reluctant prophet. He, his voice was something so powerful and it came from such a a place of darkness, and yet he shed so much light into our world. So one of these lectures, you know, and when the lecture is over, people are all over to be able to be near him and, and speak to him. It's very intense, and I always worried that it took so much out of him every time he spoke, and, and the energy that people would come to him after the, after the lectures, everybody wanted a piece of him. So I see him sitting in the back of a limo, and I see the limo driver, is arguing with someone who was an organizer. And I walked over to him and I was with my mother and a friend. And I said, Professor Rizal, I'm sure you have better things to do than to sit in the back of this limo. And he looked at me and his eyes lit up and he said, I do. My son is in a makela. He's in a, a choral performance at Ramaz and I wanna to get to that choral performance. I said, come into our car, we'll drive you. So we drove him from Danbury to New York City, which is not a very big drive, but uh, it was about an hour and 15 minutes. But it was magical because we sang the whole way. 
And that was the first time that we had a chance to sing for that long a time. You know, as a student, you get three minutes, eight minutes with him, and it's precious. But here we had an hour and 15 minutes. It was amazing. Another time I went to see him, when I graduated, I would always go back to his classroom to feel that magic. I would always go once or twice a year just to sit in there and, and soak it up. Um, in this particular class, when it was over, it was a very foggy day, and I was there with a friend, and his flight was canceled because they wouldn't fly because it was too foggy. And uh, I said to him, Professor Rizal, perhaps you need a ride to New York City? And he said, I absolutely do. So we were able to drive him to the city, which was amazing. Uh, years later, Martha Houtman asked me to lead a sing-along in his um, office after a three-day symposium on his birthday. It was such an incredible experience, and that's where these recordings um, come from. A survivor came up to me and asked me to sing a few songs, and next thing you know, Professor Rizal came out after hearing a brief der Mammon and said you could wipe the floor with the tears from that song. And I asked him to please sing again the vision of Sir Melody Tsave, which you just heard. He started with that song, and then he kept singing. It was an incredible experience that people will never forget. Some of the comments were, Boston U will never be the same. This is the highlight of my life, and I've never seen Rizal sing like that. I will never forget this all my life. So I'd like to share a special song, Fun Kosev Bizketev, which says, the Baal Shem Tov would wander from this town to that town, and what was he doing? He went to the forest, and he would meditate. He found a little stream, and he immersed. He, he made a little mikvah in the stream, and Rizal added this beautiful verse that he found a shtibola. He found a little shul, and what was he doing? The Baal Shem Tov was davening. He was praying, so I'd like to play this for you now. Oh, 
He's outside the door. That's what was said. Oh, by Rabbi Nachemia Poland. Um, I want to conclude with a song of peace that Professor Rizal sang, Shabbos Zolzain. And what was so interesting to me is the, the key that he sang with the children and the key that's all here, B minor, it's the same key and it just came out of him. So I think, I guess that's his key, but uh, I, I love that. So he ended uh, Shabbos Zolzain with a, a song of peace, always praying for peace. And we know that he was the Nobel Peace Prize recipient in 1986. And I just want to read what the Nobel Committee stated. Briefly, Rizal is a messenger to mankind. His message is one of peace, atonement, and human dignity. His belief that the forces fighting evil in the world can be victorious is a hard-won belief. continue to inspire us as we remember him. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you. We're now going to introduce our next guest, Cantor Malavani. Cantor Mal Ma Joseph Yossi Malavani first met Ellie in 1971 during a visit to New York. Um, Cantor Malavani's mother was born in Saget, Romania, and lived on the same street where Ellie lived. Originally from Israel, he has been the chief cantor of Fifth Avenue Synagogue since 1973. He holds the highest diplomas in classical music from the Royal Academy of Music and the Trinity College of Music in London, England. He is a distinguished professor of liturgical music at the Bell School of Music, Jewish Music at Yeshiva University, and he's rector of the Institute of Traditional Jewish Music in Leipzig and Berlin, Germany. Cantor Malavani has performed concerts throughout the world with major symphony orchestras and conductors, and we're so delighted to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, Ellie and I were brothers. Ellie, of course, was much older but we shared the same date of birth, which is September 30th. Eli was a man who had neshama, who had soul, next to none. Eli, when he sang, sang with so much neshama, but the neshamedic singing that he had was also an intellectual neshama. Eli loved singing, but he wanted his songs to express a message. 
and his message was um, the message of Judaism. And yes, you will all be surprised. The message of Judaism in our time, despite the fact that the songs which he sang were very old songs. Those who know Siget, and you already heard from Nadine that um, my mother lived in the same street. It used to be called the Schlangengas. The, the, um, and uh, the, because it used to turn around, used to turn around. I've been to Siget four times and I still have the graveside and Matseva of my grandfather whom I'm named after and my great grandfather. They passed away well before the Shoah, before the Holocaust. Eli, when he sang, and yes, more than that, you know, Siget is a valley, and around you have a lot of mountains. And it was in those mountains that the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, the founder of the Hasidic movement, used to walk around, as they said in Yiddish, Harum Gedreit in those places. So besides the philosophy of Hasidism, the Baal Shem Tov left us a lot of music. And it is, it was Eli who grabbed it, sang it in a most natural way, in a most authentic way as it was sung in Siget. But as I said, the message was a very powerful message to all generations. You know, um, Eli, if when you saw him now, you saw that he was singing with his hand. These were not the hands of a conductor, although he conducted very well. He was extremely musical. Because he was a Hasidic man, and especially the Vizhnitsa Chosid and his father and his mother. His mother, my mother told me that his mother was called Wiesel Neni, which means in Hungarian, anti Wiesel. And um, the Hasid, the, the Vizhnitsa Rebbe, if you ever visited at the time of davening of the Vishnitsa Rebbe, he always worked with his hand as if he was painting, as if he was painting the words which he was singing. Not a great voice, but beautiful. Ellie had everything together. Ellie used motifs which come from the mountains of the shepherds who took care of their sheep. And one of them, Ken Bakodesh Haziticha, God, I see you in the holiness. Ken Bakodesh Haziticha, Lirois, Puska Ochoedecha.
I mobilized Eli. By the way, Eli was a member of my congregation. As soon as he moved to the Upper East Side, he came, he said, now I have a chazan. I said, I said, I mean, now I have a wonderful Hasidic singer, authentic one. Eli, before Kol Nidre, we say the words, Or Zaru al Tzadik, the light is on the righteous. Ule Yishrei Lev Simcha, and the people who are honest with their heart, they should have happiness. And then we go into Kol Nidre. And he got that in Siget, in the Vishnitze Besmedrush. start singing Kol Nidre because I was crying. He transformed me straight to Siget. And, and, and whenever I'm in Europe, I'm trying to get there. It doesn't always work. But that was Eli, the Hasid. But the, his Hasidus, his authentic Hasidus, was a tefillah. It was a prayer. Eli was a meat palel. He always stood at his uh, permanent seat in the synagogue and chuckled like this and he davened as if he was in the Besta Medrash in Siget, the Vizhnitsa Besta Medrash. On the um, Yom Kippur, after he passed away, I invited Elisha to come to my shul and he came and I said, Elisha, do you know the Or Zaru al Tzadik? He says, yes. And he sang it. And I have news for you. He almost sang like his father. Tore my heart because I saw his father in front of me. Now, it's interesting. One day he came to me and he said, Yossi, why don't you sing something that I sang as a kid in the choir of the great synagogue in Siget? I said, Eli, if he will give it to me, I'll get it. He says, I'm going to call you in the evening and I'm going to sing it for you, which he did. And I immediately notated it. <clears throat> and it is from Kike Shimcha that forms part of the, of the Unesane Tokev, the Rosh Hashanah, and then Kike Shimcha. Ki lo tachpotz bemotamed, God. You don't really want people to die. And only when he comes and repents, he will live. And here is a solo that Eli used to sing in the synagogue in Sigurd. Kilo Oh, 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 oh,
One day on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur. So he repeated the word Emes. Whenever we got to the word Emes, he was loud in the shul. Emes. Because he was a man of truth. He believed in Emes. And it came through in, <clears throat> excuse me, it came through in this tefillah, in this prayer. Another very, very short. I think sometimes the large piece by two great Chazanim, Israel Alter and Moshe Genshov, Ashir Shehalvihim, the song that the Levites used to sing in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. So it goes on and goes on and it's very beautiful and I recorded it. But uh, Leon, she And if we did not, if I did not sing it for a few weeks, I received a complaint from Ellie. No, when are you going to sing it? I need Leyoim Shekulo Shabbos. Leyoim Shekulo Shabbos. Ellie was to me like a brother, was concerned about everything that I had to do with work. Never will I forget him. He's on my mind non-stop forever and ever. Thank you so much, Cantor Malavani. That was beautiful. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce now our next guest, Mati Matthew Lazar, a friend of Ellie's, who conducted him in a special concert entitled Memories and Melodies of My Childhood at the 92nd Street Y in 2010. Mati is the founder and director of the Zamir Choral Foundation and as the conductor of the Zamir Choral, founder of the North American Jewish Choral Festival, Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, 
and Zamir Noded. He has created and promoted transdenominational, transgenerational, and transpolitical Jewish musical communities for over 40 years. He conducted choirs across the United States and Israel, and including preparing choirs for Leonard Bernstein and Zubin Meida. And he's on the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary and Columbia University for almost two, for, for almost two decades. And I wanna welcome him. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Mati. He's gonna talk and sing or talk and perform and play music for us as well. All three. Thank you so much, Nadine, for this wonderful program. It's such a thrill to have Ellie's spirit evoked by close friends and students and to hear his voice, which brings back all memories and even memories that we didn't know we had. I first met Ellie in 1973 when I worked with him on a performance of his cantata, <clears throat> pardon me, Ani Ma'amin, with music by the French Jewish composer Darius Mio of featured the Zamir Chorale. But it wasn't until uh, the bar mitzvah of his son, Alicia, Mary and Ellie's son, uh, Alicia, where after Zamir did a little bit of a performance and they were descending from the stairs that Ellie all of a sudden remembered this famous tune, this visionist tune for Ani Ma'amin, the tune that he thought was the greatest piece of music he ever heard. And immediately started singing it and then came over to me and said, Monty, you must arrange this for choir. As you know, of course, now you know, Ellie was a carol conductor in Paris after the war. And so I wrote an arrangement for solo and choir and Ellie and I premiered it as a gift from Ellie to his loyal audience in the famous lecture series that he gave at the 92nd Street Y on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the lecture series. And then in 1992, he reprised the same anima, I mean, this time with a backup choir of 350 singers for a concert that I was conducting in Carnegie Hall, which was to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem. And everyone here knows how deeply Ellie felt about the reunification of Jerusalem and the Jewish aspect of Jerusalem. At that concert, he surprised the audience not only by singing, but conducting this large ensemble as well. Very impressive. The power of music to sustain memory and meaning and to bring unity and express and transmit Jewish identity and the future of the Jewish people from generation to generation was something that was a very powerful force in Ellie's life. It was one of the reasons he chose to be the honorary chairman of the Zamir Kroll Foundation. He loved singing, he understood what it meant. And when he learned that I was teaching this animamin, his animamin, to the young singers of Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, he was elated and gratified. Um, as you'll hear, this music is undulating, its contour is very plaintive, and it really represents the hope, the resignation, and the hope once again that is the trajectory of our people. You'll hear now a performance of Hazamir on the stage of the New York Metropolitan Opera House of this Ani Mamin. It's sung in tribute and in memory of Ellie in March of 2017. You can hear Ellie singing through my voice. Ani Amen. Vias Hamashia Hani Amami Bemuna Shlema Vias Hamashia Via Falpi Shayis Mamea 
Bevias ha Mashiach, Eli was, Eli was a mumcha, an expert in Jewish music, but he loved all kinds of music, especially music of the great Western composers like Mozart and, and Beethoven. And every time that I would get together with Eli, uh, very often on uh, Rosh Chodesh, he would sing the melodies of his youth, which became part of the concert that you're seeing excerpts from. But he loved particularly the second movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, where he loved to sing in harmony the melody and then the counter melody. 
uh, it spoke to him as something very Jewish, which is a good way of understanding Eli finding the Jewish interpretation, even of great Western art. But I think this says something about um, his great and deep understanding about music and about text. And I should say that after every time that we listened to Beethoven or Mozart, he always came back to me and said, but you know, Mati, Ani Mami in the Visionist Melody is still the greatest piece of music that I have ever heard. So he never lost that faithfulness. But what makes Ellie's singing so remarkable, so powerful and so inspiring is his connection to the music and the text. Jesse mentioned that his hands are moving all the time and you'll see his hands moving all the time. But that's just another expression of how he would express his entire being through the music while he was teaching us the text. And I'd like to sing for you now an example of Eli's Shalom Aleichem. It's his recollection of the song Shalom Aleichem that his uh, visionary chassid grandfather sang. Bay Shalom Aleichem Asharet Malachem Elyon me melech malche ham lochim ha kadosh baruch hu. Baruch hu li shalom malache ha shalom malache el yai. Mi melech malche ham lochim ha kadosh baruch hu. Saishem li shalom malache ha shalom malache el yai. Mi melech malche ham lochim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu When you heard Eli sing, it was opening a door into a lost world of kavanah, of intent, and of the deepest form of spirituality. Hearing him sing was like hearing him speak or being near him, an inspiration. Do we have time for one more of his tunes? Before we say Lachadodi, there's a mystical prayer, Anavakoch, where we ask God to, with his strength of his right hand, make sure that he unties the, all the sins that we have and allow us to be redeemed. I believe this is a tune that Eli actually wrote himself. Ano ano bekayak ano ano gedulas yamin ko ano hati etzeruro ano ayon ano 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 bekayak ano gedulas yamin ko ano hati etzeruro His voice was like a bas kol coming down from heaven. A kol de mama daka. One never heard Eli shout. Eli spoke softly with direct intent. And if we close our eyes, he's still speaking to us and still singing to us. He is Zichro Baruch. Thank you so much, Mati. That was so beautiful. Now we're going to hear Ellie sing Harachman from the concert that Mati and Ellie did at the 92nd Street Y.
אוי, הרחמן הוא ינחילנו, יום שכולו שבת ומנוחה. הרחמן הוא ינחילנו, יום שכולו שבת ומנוחה. אוי, הרחמן הוא ינחילנו, יום שכולו שבת ומנוחה. אוי, הרחמן הוא ינחילנו, יום שכולו שבת מנוחה. אוי, הרחמן הוא ינחילנו, יום שכולו שבת מנוחה. אוי, הרחמן הוא ינחילנו, יום שכולו שבת מנוחה. 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 I love hearing, hearing him sing. It's so, so beautiful. Um, every, we wanted to leave everyone. We're going to have some more music on the way out. But we wanted to all share our thoughts. And um, Ariel, I'm going to start with you. Just a sentence or two about, about Ellie's musical legacy. Hmm. There was a, a great Hasidic master, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, who said, that when two people speak at the same time, it's cacophony. But when two people sing together, if they do it right, it can be harmony. And we're living in a time of tremendous, tremendous polarization and anger and distance and breakdown in communication. And I hear Professor Wiesel telling us that when we can't speak to each other, we need to remember to sing. And I hear him telling us that the song that has lasted for thousands of years, the Jewish song of joy and of yearning, needs to be transmitted to the next generation. Thank you. Um, Cantor Kachko Gray? These are words that Elie Wiesel uh, used in a foreword to a, a, a book um, on the Holocaust, music of the Holocaust. Because this is the way they taught us in Cheder. Az Yashir Moshe, in the future tense, meaning not then did Moses sing, but then shall he sing. The soul of our people is in their song. More correctly, is our song. Thank you. Cantor Malavadi? Well, I think that I said a lot uh, before. Eli was the man of music. I agree with Matt. He, he was good in classical music too, but Eli was, as I said, the authentic presenter of the real Jewish traditional Hasidic melodies. He was unique in that. He was special in that. He captured the people's souls whenever he sang, even when we danced on Simchat Torah with Hakafot, and he didn't say Tzavei Yeshuos Yaakov, but he said like they said in Siget, Tzavei, 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 Tzavei Yeshuos Yaakov. Eli was the authentic man, the authentic presenter, and as I said before, he was the second brother that I did not have. And uh, I miss him badly. I miss him in shul. And uh, his memory is in our hearts at home. Wherever I go, I talk about him. And we keep his name alive. Thank you. Mati, Mati Lazar. I'll say that beyond the music, the greatest loss of Ellie for us 
and for the world was his modeling and his being the perfect incarnation of being a totally committed Jew and simultaneously a totally committed humanitarian. God, we miss that. We miss him. This is what the world needs, the legacy and the existence and the vision of Elie Wiesel. Amen. Amen. So Beautiful. thank you so much. Um, Ellie, who is the co-founder of Moment in 1975, and he was a very special person to me and in my life and in all your lives and in all of our lives. And I'm just so glad that we were all here today to remember him and we can remember him together for this hour. And I just know for me, I, I loved, loved hearing his voice. I loved his singing today. And I loved hearing your singing and I loved hearing his singing. Um, made me just feel so wonderful. And I just, and I wanna thank you all so much. Kendra Malavati, Ariel Berger, Andrew Deborah Kachko Gray, Ma Matthew Lazar for joining us and for spending this time. And to all of you who stayed with us all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who stayed with us. Um, I know we've gone over and I just want to say thank you and Shana Tova. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Suzanne. Shana Tova. Shana Tova to you all. Chak Sameach and Gmar Tov. And we continue to sing his songs and remember him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. I agree. Can you hear that song? Yeah. A lot more singing to do here. Yeah, a lot more. Laura, I feel we just really began to begin to began to get into this in a way. So we'll do some more singing and thinking. Thank you. Shana Tova. Thank you. Shana Tova, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.